Nerd Academy podcast is released weekly at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, available on our website at www.thenerdacademypodcast.com and wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find the Nerd Academy podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can also help support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash the Nerd Academy podcast, where every donation allows us to bring you more exciting content every week. Good morning, class, and welcome back to the Nerd Academy podcast, your source for nerddom news and commentary. I am your host and superior web headmaster, Jared Bachman Stubbs. And we have, a, I, I don't want to say a light episode. Uh, we're going to be talking about a very serious topic up top because the, uh, the, the, the age old trick that the internet loves to pull on Travis and I happened again, where literally the moment I pressed render on our episode last week, a big old story uh, that was very much tangential, not tangentially, directly related uh, to the Jonathan Major situation was published in Rolling Stone. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, talk about some Deadpool stuff uh, and talk secret invasion. Obviously, we gotta we gotta a your cues as well. So uh, I think it'll be a brisker episode than normal, uh, but still uh, uh, got the got some meat on the bones. And also uh, now I'm going to bring your resident Green Lantern and Travis Grossman uh, because whenever you're watching this, barring acts of God in Congress the returning episode of heroic history 101 will be out question mark um because this is pro- assuming travis and i don't need to take a break while we record heroic history 101 it will be out uh if it if we do need to take a break it will also need to render uh which will mean it will be out later today as well uh so if you're not already a patron go to the five dollar tier you'll get access to both of our patron exclusive shows, Heroic History 101, where Travis and I dive into a comic run and just, you know, talk about it, Uh, as well as our Knights of the Nerd Republic versus series, which, speaking of, Spencer's back in town here this week. So we're going to be getting to work on Porter Angle versus Count Dooku ASAP, as well as having an Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny review uh, out for you guys, not next week, so either next weekend or early the week after. Uh, but there will be an Indiana Jones conversation coming y'all's way. Uh, I've that, that hat has been burning a hole on my head, and I want to wear it on an episode of this podcast, and not just on Bombadcast, because they don't get to get the exclusive rights to me wearing hats. Um, but yeah, Travis, how you doing, buddy? I've had several people in my life... Uh, message me individually and be like, dude, Indiana Jones is really good. And I'm like, dude, I've never seen Indiana Jones. And they're like, <laughs> you're the nerd. Like, you're, of all the people, you're the one I texted about this. Because I was like, well, yeah, it's, a, it's it's Indiana Jones. Of course he's seen it. No. Yeah, this is, this is nerd shit. Surely he's familiar. That's really I had, funny. I had an inkling last night, and I might just start, like in my free evenings after work, finally pounding through movies of like of nerd things that I've just never seen. Um, I've technically never watched the amazing Spider-Man movies huh. as much as I, yeah. Right. Like as much as I meme on them, I've only, I've seen pretty much all of Tasm one. Well, I saw the trailer for Tasm two, which means I've seen Tasm two and. All right. Okay. I wouldn't say it if literally every single person on the internet didn't also say it when the movie came out. Oh, and you know what everybody else on the internet always says? Stupid shit. Come on. Jared, we're people on the internet. We're the smart ones. (coughs) By comparison. Uh, yeah, but like most of the X Men movies, I've never actually seen, or like I've only seen parts of in passing. And oh my goodness, um, right? I was never I, a big X Men kid. I was told that it is apparently a quote unquote random pick for first class to be my favorite. 
I don't know if you heard that. That was really loud. We'll plus that. Someone's radio, like from their car. I heard a voice. Yeah, I heard a voice. I had no idea what that was. That's hilarious. Um, um, I I feel like that's not weird. Like everyone I've talked right? to about X Men is like First Class and Days of Future Past. If you don't count Logan, are like the top two. I don't, I don't count Logan because I've seen Logan. I gotta revisit Days of Future Past because it's been a minute. Um, but yeah, uh, that's exciting. I look forward to hearing what you think about it. I'm assuming that was your segue into saying you're gonna try and give a uh, Indiana Jones a try. Maybe not. Not like. It's not like a priority. I'm not Jones and Deceit in theaters. That wasn't meant to be a pun. I did that by accident. Death to all of them. Oh, my my movie theater budget's tied up in Oppenheimer and Barbie in two weeks. So I feel yeah. that. I feel that. Uh, very much in the same boat. Uh, but yeah, uh, before we jump in to the news, you guys, you know the drill. We have a word from our lovely sponsors. It's Sunday's Bloody Mary. Uh, and very soon, I think you guys will be hearing from our dear friend, Master Allen of Level Up Savers at the mid-roll of the show. But that is to be determined next week. Uh, so you guys know Sunday's Bloody Mary has the most badass Bloody Mary accoutrement in the multiverse with their three-time award-winning spicy Caesar mix, as well as their mild and traditional mixes if the spice isn't for you. They also have their pickled dilly beans, okra, and asparagus if you're trying to get your freak on and garnish that bad boy. And if you're really nasty, you go ahead and salt that rim too. So get on over to sundaysbloodymary.com slash shop. Use code TNAP, T-N-A-P, and check out and you get 10% off your order and help out your favorite nerds while you do it. All right, I've, we've, we've bandied about enough uh, before we jump into this one. So as I uh, earlier addressed last week, just, just as I pressed start on a render that I knew would take eight hours, um, Rolling Stone published an exclusive article about Jonathan Majors and a alleged uh, line of abuse that spans a decade. Uh, this is going to be one of those, we're just going to read from the article. Um, and just as I said that, it's telling me about not being allowed to read it. So give me one minute, and I'm going to go. You don't get the Rolling Stone in print? Uh, no, I guess not. It's so weird because I read it on my phone for free when the article dropped. Um, yeah, that was your 10 free articles. Don't you know? Yeah, all 10 of them. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have that one tweet you pass over four times is seven tweets. <laughs> That's why I got to get to threads threads brought to you by Musk. Um, all right. Uh, this is from the vulture article. I believe that is covering, uh, the Rolling Stone piece. Uh, so apologies for this being a little less prepared than I anticipated. Jonathan Major's alleged abuse reportedly extends far beyond the recent incidents that led to his misdemeanor assault charges. According to a massive investigation from Rolling Stone, Majors is abusive in at least two past relationships, including one physically. Further, he allegedly got physical with peers during drama school and intimidated crew on multiple recent films. Most notably, uh, friends of one ex- Claim Major's abuse escalated to him alleg allegedly strangling her. Another source said the other ex called their relationship emotional torture. Major's attorney said that he vehemently denies the allegations. Major's legal team uh, reportedly sent six testimonies from women he previously dated or was close with to Rolling Stone. The four said they did not approve them, with one even adding that hers was not true. The only woman who approved their statement dated Major's from 13 to 18 and said he was sweet, kind, and gentle. Majors also allegedly uh, made members of the costume department on the set of his 2022 film Devotion uh, per the... Uh, I'm sorry, let me start that over because I can't read. No. That, that, no, the, that, that was just written weird. Uh, per report, a source involved in the production called The Situation Borderline Abusive uh, said Majors seemed to take some kind of sick pleasure, quote-unquote, 
in the situation, Gru reportedly told producers that Majors uh, told the producers about Majors, but the production company told Rolling Stone there was not a formal complaint made. On the set of his upcoming movie, Magazine Dreams, Majors allegedly pushed one of the members of the production and physically intimidated another, which led to a complaint. One source on the production claimed it wasn't physical. Uh, Major's attorney also denied these allegations, blaming them on his method acting style, which can be misconstrued as rudeness at times. At Yale's David Geffen School of Drama, where Major studied after his bachelor's, the actor was known for his intensity. As one former peer put it, uh, he allegedly got into multiple physical altercation or confrontations uh, with others, even during scenes. And one alum said uh, that they felt physically it felt in the physical danger around him, quote unquote. Administrators once reportedly even sent an email, uh, quote, reminder about rehearsal etiquette and violence, unquote, uh, after two separate incidents involving majors. Uh, majors attorneys once again denied these allegations. The allegations come as majors misdemeanor case moves through the court system with a trial set for August 3rd. At the time, the New York Times reported uh, recently reported that the woman who accused Majors of assault, Grace Jabari, has probable cause to be arrested. However, as the Times noted, that is not affecting Majors' case, and uh, in domestic abuse situations, both partners often accuse the other of abuse. In New York, where the alleged assault happened, law enforcement must determine the primary aggressor, and even if Jabari is arrested as well, the district attorney could uh, decline to prosecute her. Meanwhile, one source told Rolling Stone, quote, no one is surprised, unquote, at the timing of the new major's allegations. It always feels like it was a matter of time because his behavior never changed. Uh, he's kind of a bad dude, and now it's just catching up with him. So, uh, I, I, I wanted to acknowledge this one up top. It is noted in the episode description for last week. I said it on Twitter. Um you know, I, I, it, I, we brought it up last week and we were, we were kind of like scant with it. So I don't, I don't know if we actually like gave the full story and just kind of assumed that anybody listening, uh, who got the joke, got the joke. And we were going to leave it there. Uh, back when Travis and I were a part of what is now referred to as project louder in our comic book show, their hall of heroes, uh, we very infamously, uh, it was it was the week that Spider-Man Far From Home broke a billion dollars at the box office. And I, I, I will take the personal L because I was the one who said it um, and then got you and Spencer to agree with me on it. Uh, very confidently yeah. said. Uh, I very vehemently agree with you. Like, yeah, this wasn't that yeah, you yeah. coerced me. I, we were I arguing. Know. You know, said it, I, and we all went. Well, absolutely, yes. <laughs> I know. I just want to be. I'm the one who said it. I don't. I. I didn't want. I didn't want to imply that everybody had as equal pie on their face as I did. Um, but I very confidently uh, started talking about how these these this crazy box office success of Far From Home because its success was largely predicated on it being part of the MCU that Sony would be out of their damn minds if they ever wanted to terminate their relationship with Disney Marvel and jeopardize it. Now, there was a set release schedule at uh, Dubac Discussion Network at the time, now Project Louder, that had our show come out on Fridays, which meant, among other things, there would be breaking news that we would that we would get to about a week late every time, um, which is neither here nor there, except for the fact that we recorded that story on a Monday and the next day, within about 12 hours, uh, the big moment uh, where everybody where, where Sony put their dick on the table and said, we're taking our Spider-Man shaped ball and we're going home. And we, for the first time, we're like, we need to record an emergency episode of this fucking podcast uh, and where we, 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 we wrangled ourselves up and we put a little coda, uh, a little a little 30, 40 minute coda at the end of that episode of us going, hi, we're big old dumb, dumb, stupid idiot heads. Uh, oopsie. We were wrong. Uh, very yeah. hilariously wrong. And Remember how I, naive we were to think that Sony would make good business decisions? <laughs> fucking A, right? Um, I remember. 
Which, speaking of Sony, it's just a story that fell through the cracks when we were getting ready last week. Also, um, it does not matter how amazing uh, the Spider-Verse movies are. Treat artists like fucking oh. people. Uh, I have I, I have heard things and rumblings uh, about Lord and Miller not being great to work with. Um, I have, through the grapevine, heard about the hellified mess they created on the set of solo when they were still attached to it. And yeah, uh, everything I've heard about spider verse after hearing about the solo stuff checks out. Uh, and again, it is possible for two things to be true that they could, that they make great movies and are also kind of dicks. <clears throat> and in the name, uh, or anyway, all of that Spider-Man stuff to say, uh, I can't remember a time since then where we got caught with our pants down more with a story, uh, especially because I, with the same confidence that I said that Sony would never jeopardize their mm -hmm. relationship with uh, Disney Marvel, uh, said with an almost equal level of confidence, uh, the the preponderance of evidence is seeming to skew back towards Jonathan Major's side in that case. Um, the situation is continuing to develop. It is continuing to become more and more complicated. Um, you know, I, 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 I do want, I, I, I have always found a very weird and at times uncomfortable relationship with important news stories like this and what we try to cover. You know, I, I invoked the term, uh, when we had Armin on for our flash review, you know, the whole concept of being a dick joke journalist that like we cover entertainment news, we cover, we cover relatively low brow entertainment news. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're talking about Cape shit and space wizards. And typically our fare is pretty light. Typically, you know, the, the heaviest stuff we get into is where we start talking about uh, unions <laughs> and the heavy, you know, you know, it's, it's that joke. Travis uh, thought I uh, was very entertained by uh, uh, on Twitter. I think it was, I was talking to uh, nude Gunray on Twitter where it was like, you know, starting a star Wars YouTube channel to like micro dose people into becoming a socialist. And I said, we do that, but superhero stuff. Um, and it's true. Um, I, I do not think it's an accident that most of our subscribers are subscribed to the same leftists. We are, um, no, not, am I taking credit for that? No, but we've definitely found the right audience of leftists who want a Cape shit show. Um, yes. which we're happy to have you, uh, check out the Patreon. Um, but, when you come up on a story like this that is constantly developing, that has real world stakes, you know, you try to treat it with the, the, the gravity it deserves. Um, but it, it also becomes hard because I do think this is the, this is without a doubt the most serious story I think we have ever covered. This is this ongoing story with uh, John Majors. And I just, I want to reiterate the level of seriousness and gravity that we uh, that we think that this situation deserves, and that you know slip ups are going to happen because this is you know this is again the, the stakes are higher here. Um, so yeah, I as we have said countless times, um, these kinds of accusations need to be taken seriously, and at the end of the day, um, people are going to speculate wildly. That's not what we do here. You know, I don't, I don't, I, I, the last thing I want to do is become a part of the cacophony, um, that treats this like a sport. And I've brought it up every time we've talked about the Jonathan major situation. I am not going, I am not going to take part in depth. V heard part two. I am not going to join this, you know, a sea of howler monkeys screeching about how women can't be trusted. And again, I, it doesn't matter where you fall in the Depp Heard issue. I don't think it is unreasonable to point out that it is the same type of dude and same type of content creator 
who canonized Johnny Saint and Johnny Depp into being a patron saint, uh, who were the same people who were, for example, saying that Tory Lanez was innocent when all evidence points to the fact that he shot Megan Thee Stallion in the fucking foot. Um, it is it is habitually the same crowd. It is people who are treating a very serious legal situation with very real stakes, with very, very human uh, and just visceral emotions behind it, like a spectator sport. And as though the moment there is even a little bit of potentially exonerating evidence in play uh, that, again, start hooting and hollering like, like a touchdown on the scored. And I think it's deeply inappropriate. Um, I would like to think we didn't engage in that. And again, the Rolling Stone piece uh, continues to make the situation more and more uh, hazy to see through. And again, we'll see what happens in court. The unfortunate like results of people like us clamoring for cape shit to be taken seriously and movie, you know, media like this to be taken seriously and the people involved with it to be taken seriously is that when something serious like this happens, we have to treat it seriously. Yeah. And, and like the, cause you think about if this had happened in like 1998, granted we don't have the media infrastructure we have now, but like, we the, none of this ever gets covered back then like even sans me too or if it does yeah. it's it's it, i i don't think it gets the time in the sun it he, deserves he would have had to literally be a serial killer for it to make the waves that it it may, it's making now and I, I that's very that's a very extreme exaggeration of the, of you know my my point but the idea that the the media and the news would care this much about someone in superhero movies and like maybe it's not fair to compare but i i don't think my point is i don't think we as an audience not us in particular but like as a general audience have matured and adapted to the point of being able to take a situation like this seriously especially when you know you have situations like depth fee heard where again, any exonerating evidence at all is now the, t- the touchstone of see, we were right. Women are terrible. Yeah. You know, because again, the internet is nothing. Yeah. But monsters. Yeah. And it's, 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 just, it's a, it's a very severe, uh, pointed response to me to, um that i you know i again like it, it, it was the way the media handled depth fee heard that i knew the next time there was a situation like this it was going to be a it was it was going to be a fuck fest and uh, here we are you know the the last thing we want to do as individuals and with you know our our our, our baby you know with teen app um is to add to toxic poisonous harmful discourse and yeah, you know, uh, we'll be covering developments as they come, but you know, we'll, 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 we will, we will see how this develops, uh, from here. Um, on a similar note, uh, some of you, uh, those of you who follow me on Twitter, um, may have seen this. I'm going to shout out the Twitter user so you guys can check it out. Uh, at your leisure, it is on. It is it is a response to the Teen App Twitter's post asking for Q and A stuff this week, and the uh, Pedro Parquet, uh, listener of the show, uh, left a linked tweet to uh, just uh, de- part of the Tena Cuerta situation that has developed. Most of it is very much in Spanish. Um, yeah, I, I did try to pass through it a little bit, and uh, you know, it, I took it, Spanish it, it, one last semester, and that's it. You know, I I don't I I it's one of those I don't feel qualified. There is information out there that I do not feel qualified to bring to you guys, um, but I also don't want to just pretend I did not acknowledge that person's. Uh, you know, hey, you might want to look into this. Um, so, 
seek that information out on uh, y'all's own time. And if uh, somebody picks it up and does a lot of translating with it, uh, then we'll probably talk about it next week. Uh, but all of that said, um, on to the lighter cape bullshit. Um, you know, I don't often <laughs> uh, like make a huge deal out of set photos, typically. But we got a new look at Deadpool 3. Um, one moment. Holy pop-ups, Batman. Uh, we got a new look at Wade Wilson's new duds in Deadpool 3. Uh, Travis, have you seen it yet? Nope. Okay, you're going to like it. It is it is very red. Um it's very red and it's like they've moved the sectioning of the uh black on the suit around. Um trying to find a good picture here cuz it is kind of, you know, grainy ass set photos. Yeah. But yeah, it's very it, it this is continuing the MCU phase four, phase five uh tradition of just like suits ripped off the page. Here we go. Cool. Let me get this screen share up. That's Sunday's Bloody Mary still. That's what he's wearing. It's just Bloody Mary. Yeah, next. I know. It's or crazy. It's We're gonna be at the premiere. We're at, we Deadpool actually have Cammy. Is- in the movie because we're the, they're uh, a sponsor. Yes. So we got the new Deadpool suit. Very comic accurate, you know. And, and again, like the, the difference is, it is, again, it's very subtle. This suit is redder uh, than the original versions. Um, there's a picture of like the, uh, uh, it's not very far out. Uh, but again, the segments of black, instead of kind of being like more on the legs and scattered throughout, you kind of just have this, line of it on yeah. the shoulders on like the little pauldrons and then coming down the side. Um, there is uh this picture was the one that super sold me like seeing him with the utility belt and the holsters and this redder costume. Uh, I also do like how the mask looks mm-hmm. on it. And like, do you even a lot of that too has to do with the color correction in the, like on the movie, right? Like, yeah. Sorry, I was trying to click off of something and accidentally clicked the theme music. We're on a roll How? today, guys. Sorry. How dare you? Um, but yeah, so I mean, like, it comes down to the the whole like Man of Steel suit not looking like the Man of Steel suit in Man of Steel, right? Yeah. The they it's probably gonna it's gonna look great. I like the, how this looks. Um, it does look oddly naked without the belt. But like, I think any Deadpool suit would look oddly naked without the belt, in the same yeah. way that a bat suit looks oddly naked without a utility belt. You know, yeah. Especially when that's part of the design in mind. Um, yeah, I, I just on Twitter when I was looking for something else for a different story. Um, hard R is trending. Uh, because haha, funny, but it's people talking about Deadpool saying that the rating is still. <laughs> yeah. I got scared for a second. I was like, well, I don't want to know why hard R is. Oh, okay. That's well, because like it said hard R and then Deadpool. So I was like, okay, this is like definitely about the rating of the movie. But of course, the first tweet is black Twitter wondering why hard R is trend. Oh, Lordy. Um, it's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, all right. Well, we're chugging light wrong here, uh, so let's keep moving. Uh, I think we're ready to talk Secret Invasion. Oh, uh, Superman show previews tonight, today, if when the show comes out. Oh, midnight. Cool. Yeah. So, um, are you going to be watching that? Is that going to be? Oh, one hundred percent. Are you back on it, TV um, assignments? It it goes straight to Max after uh, airing on TV, like on cable. So I gotta lock back into my Max because I I'm still on my family's Max. And I think we got bumped off like during the change over. Mm -hmm. Your account's probably still live. You just have to get the new app. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's like 
slightly less efficient than the old app. Oh, why wouldn't it be? Right. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> everything's worse. It's um, it's it is David Zaslov infecting things with a fucking glance. Of course, it doesn't work right anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as soon as that goes live, I'm watching it. It's going to well, be. I am going to try to get logged back in to Max so we can cover that together. This is very funny. Uh, my girlfriend is in the other room watching SVU on Hulu. And she, she, she's been very excitedly informing me of whenever there's like an actor we like who shows up in an episode. Mm-hmm. And there's there's a bunch of people uh, in this one. Uh, and she very excitedly texted me. Oh, my God. Foggy Nelson. And just what just texted me in all caps. Oh, my God. Foggy Nelson. No. Uh, oh, no. Foggy. No. <laughs> Plot twist. It's actually John Favreau. Foggy Nelson. Anyway. Remember oh that? God. Oh yeah, that's another thing. Apparently, Ben allegedly Ben Affleck's going to be in Deadpool three. Yeah, I've seen. Which all I think it's hilarious like, that we've did that we're doing this again already. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Well, because the internet doesn't learn. No. The internet chooses not to learn. I am. This is this is going to turn into a epi- This is going to turn into one of those episodes where there's just a forty five minute conversation about discourse. I can I can I say something before you start? Please do. I want it to happen. Deadpool. I want everyone to speculate on everything for Deadpool, just because I want to see Ryan Reynolds go ape shit online afterwards. I want to see Ryan meme on everybody, call yeah. everyone stupid, like you know. I want Ryan Reynolds to be I want Ryan Reynolds to publicly be quote tweeting big screen leaks den of nerds fucking my time to shine behind the mat everybody I I want their websites to have cameos in the movie I knocked over my D&D dice um no I you know the flash with like the weird animated cameos which again your mileage will vary they didn't they you know they don't really add anything to the story really they are there for superfluous reasons which is not inherently bad you know like there is the, like like I, I i i very much come to the point where i'm like there is no idea within art that is inherently bad. It is a matter of execution. And there is this weird, like this weird binary when it comes to Cape shit anymore. That is a mix of give me cameos, show me things. And nostalgia equals bad Mm -hmm. and i'm so deeply fascinated by that binary because on one end of the spectrum you have all the people who were like getting angrier and angrier by the week that she hulk wasn't just secretly a show about matt murdoch you know and like the the joke i made on twitter a thousand years ago of like every new disney plus show and with spider-man no way home that it's like, when's Daredevil sh- going to show up? Where's Daredevil going to show up? When's Daredevil going to show up? When's Daredevil going to show up? Daredevil gets his own TV show. When's Punisher going to show up? That it's like this weird like snake eating its own tail of we want characters whose name isn't in the title just to see them. Yeah. And then again, the, the opposite end of that spectrum is like, oh, like you just want the thing. And that 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 like says that it's inherently bad for some very confusing reason like the other day i i I quote tweeted this person who was like they were talking about Zack snyder's fucking rebel moon and they they out yet no (laughs) thank god um they were fucking talking about rebel moon right and apparently Zack snyder like did an interview where he was like uh lucasfilm shot my pitch down because it was it was definitely going to end up with an R rating 
and there weren't enough pre-existing characters and the like the, the I also the- happened to say that I marched the entire way across Italy to get here uh, and declared myself the dictator and they didn't like that <laughs> They wouldn't hold the meeting in Rome for me for some reason. So specific. Is Zack Snyder Mussolini in this example? Didn't he quote, didn't he quote Mussolini when he got caught? Oh on the my Potsdam? fucking god! You're right. I forgot about that. <laughs> that was the, that, the, that was my tipping point. I was getting so close to being like, I can I can be a ship passing in the night with Zack Snyder. With like, I don't like his. I'm not a fan of his art. It's not made for me. I can I can just pass on by in the night. People got what they wanted. And then his response to the the bot thing was, well, of course I know about the bots. I am the bots. Mussolini. And I was like, okay, well. So much shit has happened with him that I forgot about the Mussolini quote with the Snyder cut. We all just kind of um, forgot. We were just like, eh, there's too much real shit. And this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> With, like, oh, yeah, right. We have to take cape shit seriously now. There's so much real shit happening that a mainline director of movies quoted one of the fathers of fascism. <laughs> quoted the guy that Hitler was a stan of. Quoted the guy that corporate America in the 30s was a stan of and went, eh, that's fine. <laughs> Slap that off. Let that be a blurb on a fucking DVD. Um, but a bunch of people, or not a bunch of people, this is one person who had a very, like, had a, had a tweet pop off where they quote tweeted the article of Snyder bitching about not getting his Star Wars movie and said something to the effect of, uh, the reason why Star Wars movies will never be good again is because the suits won't the suits won't take risks and insist on us seeing the same and, and, and insist on circling back to the same six characters. And I quote tweeted them and I put the quote, the suits keep circling back to the same six characters. And it was a picture of the Acolyte. Of season of, of the Mandalorian, of what was it? Andor and Jedi Survivor. And then anybody who disagreed with me in the quote tweets or in the replies made the point of saying, ah ha ha. But what you don't acknowledge is that Darth Vader is in Jedi Survivor. And Andor is a spinoff of Rogue One. And Boba Fett, Luke Skywalker, Ahsoka Tano, etc. appear in The Mandalorian. And the accolade isn't out yet, but it takes place in the High Republic. So we don't know who we'll see. And like it had this like checkmate liberal kind of fucking tone to it. And I'm like, okay, is your issue like characters showing up in things? Like, is the issue that there are Star Wars characters in Star Wars? And I know that this isn't the fucking Star Wars show, but like that mentality makes me run a run, makes me want to run face first into a wall. Like the cape shit is dominated by people who like I want I want character B to be the main character in a show with character A's name in it. And yep. the fucking Star Wars side of things is people going. No, I think it's unreasonable for Darth Vader to be in a video game about Jedi during the dark times. And that like, it is an affront to art that Luke Skywalker's in the Mandalorian. Like I just, I, from both ends, I want to hit people with a fucking fire extinguisher. Two things. One, this conversation has now meant something because it brought me to a, a, put words in my head that form a point about secret wars that I didn't know I had. So thank you. Secret um, wars or secret invasion, secret invasion. The, the, the one that we are talking the one about, that, the one that is yeah. out. Yes. The one that we've been watching. Um, so that's good. I have words now to my thought. 
and I'm happy about that. Um, I think there is a general lack of understanding of how this shit gets made by oh, everybody 100%. involved. 100%. Like, and, like, obviously, like, we know that. I think it needs to be said out loud. I remember when No Way Home came out. And you are the biggest Spider-Man fan I know. And I know a lot of Spider-Man fans. I have Spider-Man hanging on my wall. Like a damn near life-size Spider-Man on my wall. You're the biggest Spider-Man fan I know. You are the only person I know. Barring like Lexi, right? Who saw that movie. And didn't immediately go, okay, in the next three movies, here's what we're going to get. <laughs> you are the only person who wasn't, and I say that like I talk to a lot of people, but like so many of my friends like at my old job and like just everywhere were like, oh, and this is how we're going to get this character. And in the comics, Ned becomes Hobgoblin, so they're going to work on that. And then we're like, they might introduce Miles and he's going to go to college. And I'm like, guys. Sony's about to put out Morbius. I don't think you understand what's about to happen to Sony Pictures. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, we had to... They are... They... Sony... <laughs> bring it all around. We are on record Going saying back Sony to our could... original make, sin. <laughs> Sony couldn't possibly make the worst possible business decision of their lives. And literally in 12 hours did it. If you think that Sony has a plan or that Marvel is going to dare to plan around Sony, you are in for a sad, sad time with the MCU. Like, they, there is not a chance that they are planning anything for Spider Man right now because it's just way too unsure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know. Look- they they fucking said that. They've been like, yeah, Tom Holland has like 18 projects on the fucking docket. He's going to get through that. We're going to wait till some other stuff calms down. And then we're going to circle back to like going, okay, what are we doing for the next batch of like Tom Spider-Man movies? And then like on the other end of that, within like within the contained MCU, there's a reason certain characters are getting selected. Like there's a reason... I talk about um, we we talk about with the DCEU a lot, and I'll probably talk about it in heroic history. Go be a patron, listen to heroic history. I'm going to talk more about the Flash in that because I I can't separate the two in my head. You don't. Five dollars here. Five dollars. It's five dollars to hear me rant about a movie. What more could you love? Um, that the creative decisions that ruin the DCEU for me are made too far down the pipeline. Um, to be corrected, right? Like Zack Snyder's vision of the M- like uh, MCU. Jesus Christ, um, Zack Snyder's vision of the DCEU is a problem for me because it was entire. Like it feels like it's all Zack Snyder's vision, and the back here in the very beginning of the creative process. They were like, eh, we'll let the director do whatever they want. And it gets flubbed. And then the other directors in the project have to be like, and in Marvel, it was very, at least in the beginning, it felt very much like, hey, we don't have like a plan plan. There's an outline ish. Like, like when they're, when they're going and they get to, and they're in phase two, like, okay, we need to introduce space shit. We can't just rely on Thor for space shit. Who else do we have? Well, we don't have the Fantastic Four. Who else do we have? Okay. Guardians of the Galaxy. Give us an opportunity to market characters that previously weren't marketed. That we can pair with the director that we think will do really well. Which, you know, they scored with James Gunn. Congratulations. Yeah, let's say that. Um, That's all history. Right? Like, the... The decision to use the Guardians of the Galaxy, will you shut up, was not made with James Gunn. It was made way up at the top, of course, while I'm making my point. Um, Like, it's made up at the top. We're going to use the Guardians for space shit. Yeah. And then from that decision, they plan what to do. 
And part of that decision was we're going to start using characters that people don't know about because it's going to boost sales for other things too. Like everyone's yeah. always going to buy a Spider-Man figure. One of the reasons yeah. I didn't get into reading Marvel comics is because there were four ongoing Guardians storylines in trade at the time. Like it was too much. Um, and that approach worked until and is continuing to work to some extent after Endgame. I think the biggest issues right now are hold that thought, like write that down if you have to. I think what you're about to say is going to get into Q and A territory. Interesting. Because right now I'm just bitching about discourse. I'm I'm complaining about discourse because I think people aren't thinking critically about the things they're seeing. No, no one's talking not. about the COVID of it all. Oh no no no! Which like the idea that COVID is not the main player and why things feel off is asinine. Oh, but Travis, it's been three years. Of course, it's no longer a thing. Anyway, um, we're going to press pause in this conversation. Okay. Because I because this is, like I said, write it down. We're going to take a break. We're going we're gonna to talk secret invasion, and then we're going to get back to this specific conversation. Because I just, I got, I'm, I, am, I am bitter about discourse, and I realized that we were about to just T-bone, uh, T-bone an entire section of the Q&A that's going to end up giving us a double the show time. So we're going to take a quick break, talk secret invasion, and then have a three-hour conversation about why fucking nerds suck and we belong yeah. in the lockers and getting swirly still. It, it doesn't help that I was listening to a podcast about Gamergate today. Oh, buddy. Which one? Yeah. Um, that Pro Mania 500. We are I was talking about they have an episode on Gamergate. Episode three of Secret Invasion: The Betrayal. Um, I really enjoyed this episode. God damn it. Um, yeah, he does a good I job swear, covering it. I, 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 I it's episode, this is the second week in a row that I hit you with the cut, episode, cut here. I'm leaving that one in. I'm leaving that one in. For this That's show. God damn it. <laughs> yeah. Have like blown uh, to the top. That, go the listen to the Promania 500. It's really good. And the guy's kind of like, I loved everything about I this. I Alex do stand up, but he lives But in then Philly. it hit me that this is and only six episodes long. <laughs> well, if you ever decide to bite the and like, if he comes to Pittsburgh, let mm -hmm. me know. I'm going to inviting my I don't want to, I don't want to do the like, the, like, the very annoying, you know, nothing has happened taking... yet. Like the people did with like Mando season three, where it's like, the show's almost over and nothing has happened. It's like, no, you fucking ding dong like the whole fucking plot has happened up to this point <laughs> and there have been movements and developments within the plot here but i think we have similar feelings but the re the our worries are different i think that's the the difference here because this is my favorite episode of the show so far same big same big same yeah i just i am getting i think you know if you remember back to the netflix marvel days daredevil and jessica jones luke cage etc 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 what was the number one complaint seasons too long too many episodes now granted i think part of that was because people were binging it and i think people were getting fatigue from the fact yeah. that they were trying to do like 13 14 episodes in a day or in a weekend mm -hmm. but that was the big complaint Everyone's always complaining that the seasons are too long. That maybe there's an episode or two here we can cut. And granted, you know, there, there you know, we. I don't think we need like three episodes each season of Matt Murdock just going, oh, because he got the shit kicked out of him. Um, but I think that in the oh, these seasons are too too long. The pendulum has swung back so hard into. There is no way you can only tell this story in six episodes. There is no way you can only tell this story in eight episodes, you know, and like and, and, and it's interesting because there are some that I, I watched Nando V movies video about it today. And I agree with him that like Ms. Marvel Moon Knight, you can tell that they could probably have, have you know, functioned as movies. And potentially may mm -hmm. have worked better as a movie. Yeah. And then you have stuff like Andor, which had like, what was it, 12, 16 episode run? You know? 
I want to say 12. I think 12 sounds 12. right. You know, I could look episode. it up right now. Yeah, that's, that's that feels right. But like 12 episode run for Andor, I feel like, and, and not just because it's like a political thriller based show, but like I feel like Secret Invasion should be getting the Andor treatment. Now, maybe it doesn't need that. We don't know. But I feel like the, the show. Six- the six episode shows definitely to me feel like they took they took what was the original draft of a movie and instead of cutting it down to movie length just polished it the whole way through when, when that's yeah. not necessarily what it needed um yeah yeah i can see that i just you know it's it, it's just for me you know and like i said i we will if this show sticks the landing, if it, if it, you know, resolves well, we'll see. I just feel like the show's like, how do I put this? Separating the text from the meta text of this show. Like the text of the show is like everything that that, like, like like the literal events. And then we have like the, the, whatever metaphor is at play here. I like where we're at in terms of the text. I like, I like all the twists and turns we've gone on, on this fun little spy adventure so far. I don't know what the fuck the show is trying to say in terms of a metaphor yet. Like, I don't know what the show is about yet. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the show is still in its opening paragraph of whatever essay it's trying to write using the alien clandestine invasion spy thriller as a vehicle to make a point, a real world point. Now, something that just, you know, we may have to kind of accept here at some point is maybe that is not happening. Maybe this show is just about, hey, the aliens invaded the Marvel Earth and shit happened, you know, which Mm -hmm. I'd be a little let down about. I think there's a lot of fertile ground here. Um, but there are a lot of really weird conversations happening about imperialism, about race, about identity, about, um, you know, who, whose story gets to be told, who gets to be a part of history and how it's written. Um, there's a lot of weird ideas. And I, I and again, I, I don't know if you sitting there, weird is the right word, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of big ideas that I don't know if by the end of this show, we're just going to be left with a bunch of big ideas that we as the audience are just kind of meant to answer for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But you have moments like the Rhodey Fury conversation about mediocre white men that they need to, that they need to be the greatest to compete with juxtaposed with an alien race of refugees who were conned into being spies to find a new homeland. Like, by a black man. Like, that, like there, there's a lot to unpack here that, like, I'm very curious about where it's going to go. And, mm-hmm. I, like, like I said, I don't, I don't know quite yet what the mission statement objective here is. And I'm, I'm curious to find that out. Um, but aside from that, as- aside from that, like looming, maybe complaint. Um, I, I love, I've, I've loved all three episodes so far. This one, especially like I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. Um, this was definitely the most compelling episode for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I Ben Mendelsohn and Sam Jackson's chemistry is off the fucking hook. Well, especially like they're just letting they're just letting Sam do whatever he wants. 
Yeah. You know, they're, they're letting Sam, which makes sense for where his character's at in his story, right? Like, if I was Nick Fury at this point in his life, I too would just be kind of going off the cuff and motherfucking everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, right. See, my, I also have like a big picture issue that might get resolved at the end, but I don't think mine will necessarily. I think mine just might just be a creative issue from way up at the top of, um, I, when civil war came out, I am not necessarily on record in the literal sense, but I told a lot of people this after civil war came out. I love that movie. I still love that movie. Um, it would have benefited a lot from being an Avengers movie. Not because I'm like, Oh, the, well, everyone's there already just making an Avengers movie, but from a plot standpoint, civil war being a captain America movie means that Steve has to be right. And that, this conversation can't happen properly as a conversation that you have to make the dynamic in a way that Steve is fundamentally correct about the situation. If that makes sense. Uh And I think what you benefit from, from a writing perspective, making civil war an Avengers movie is that you get to have a more nuanced conversation of like, maybe that situation stays the same, but now Steve is willing to come to the table a little more discussing his issues. And maybe Tony isn't because that's a, that's a big thing with civil war is like, if they had one real conversation where Steve said anything that wasn't grandiose abstract BS, the whole plot gets resolved in 15 minutes and nothing happens. Yeah. Um, And so you, I think you get to play more with the dialogue and you get to play more with, that conversation in that movie if you make an Avengers movie. I think the reverse, and this is where I came, this is the thing I came to while we were talking earlier. I think the reverse is happening with or no, I think it would be the same. Maybe it'd be the same. I think it's the same. I think I bamboozled myself. Um, This feels like they're trying to tell a Nick Fury story. And because of that, there's a lot of elements they have to introduce really quickly to make us as the audience comfortable with really quickly. And I, th- I think it would benefit from that perspective of um, being able to play more with the metaphors with more. No- and granted, like, again, with more known characters, you have to get all these actors in place and you have to pay them their rates and you got to find a reason for them to be in the story that feels legitimate and not like they're just cameoing, et cetera, et cetera. And the ramifications of that are much greater if you're using all of your known characters um, and saying that they haven't been real the whole time. You know, that's a, that's a thing that I don't have to consider because I'm not a writer. Yeah. But well, I also think you know this. And this this is where, in my opinion, Secret Invasion as a show, as a concept, kind of like kind kind of it ends up in a precarious situation, where the the you, we talked about this last week, the big premise of the comic, you know that oh fuck moment comes when Elektra is killed. And the autopsy reveals she's a scroll. And at which point, multiple heroes and multiple long standing characters are revealed to be scrolls. And the 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 big oh my god, you know, paranoia comes from not knowing who, not knowing how, not knowing for how long. And most of the characters in this show have either are either new as of this show or are so long running that they are immediately suspicious based on the premise. And other than that, you don't have any other big reveals to do, you know, like uh, agent Ross, you know, that was a cool moment at the beginning of the show, but like there, at but there was no like, 
how long has this scroll been posing as, you know, as, as agent Ross, how long has this been going? How's that been going on? You know, like they're, 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 they're like, and I wish there was a line. I wish they would have said like ever since if they wanted, if they didn't want Ross to have been a scroll from, you know, civil war on, you know, or black Panther onward, the way they could have just been like, oh yeah, ever since he went underground with the Wakandans, blah, blah, blah. And that, and you, and okay. So we've had our first, um, false start intent. And if our first intentional false start, right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this episode all but confirms the longstanding roadie is a scroll thing. Um, but I do think it's unfortunate that Rhodey is the only character who could be a scroll. And in the same way that like trying to adapt civil war, you had to accept, like, we need to scale this down. This cannot be every superhero, every superhuman in the Marvel universe, because a, we have not, we have not introduced a lot of these characters and the unfortunate real world reality of it all is we, at the time they could not legally have a lot of those characters be in play. Mm hmm. So yeah. you arrive here where like a similar thing is happening with secret invasion. Only this time, like it's just, it's, it's still an issue of scale legally you can use whatever the fuck you want to, but it's going to be weird to have like characters that we are, people are dying to see like introduced in one episode and revealed to be a scroll before the credits. You know, it's, it's a very weird catch 22 that I'm, I'm very curious again, how they stick the landing. Yeah, I think like and there's a lot of, you know, I, I talked about this last week, the scene in the first episode or maybe the second episode. It's all one episode um, th where they establish like all of these world leaders that are immediately like, oh, and they're scrolls, by the way. Yeah, like the, it's the second episode where there's the montage of like, yeah, you know, Tucker guy, world leader, world leader, UN person. You get to skip that if this council is known characters. And yeah. you get and you get to again, I think get to play more with a lot of these themes we're talking about when you don't have to spend as much time. Because the other issue is that like besides Captain Marvel, the only scroll appearance we've seen is a goof in Spider Man. Unless I'm forgetting something, but no, if I'm no, forgetting I, I something, think I think you're on the money. And yeah, so like we we have to establish that Nick Fury made this promise to them that has not been kept, and that Nick Fury has been being helped by Scroll. I do like that idea that like Fury, yeah. Nick Fury isn't necessarily Nick Fury. Nick Fury is Nick Fury in 19 Scrolls, and we've never known this whole time. I think that's a cool concept. Yes, um, but like we have to establish that there's this many scrolls living on the planet we have to establish and like everything's it feels like they're telling us too much like i keep waiting for moments of intrigue to be left on the table for us to think about like so in in this episode for example after the museum scene uh talos walks out he gets bumped by gaia but we aren't told right away. Like we're, we're obviously f foreshadowed that it's Gaia. And like, they didn't have to tell us. Yeah. I mean, there's also a very brief, cool moment of tension where like for a moment, you're like, Oh, is this one of Gravix boys? Like, is this, yeah, like, like, is, exactly. is, like, is, this is this a shooter for Gravic? And then like, you see the phone change hands and go, Oh motherfucker, that's Gaia. There's yeah. Great, and then you, you see the great, great moment. Fantastic. And moment. you see the, like him, the, I say him, but like Gaia being this guy walks away. Yeah. And like you watch the, the traveling shot to the car and oh, she's been at the car the whole time. Right. And like that's very cool. You can actually still see that guy moving. Guy. Once we yeah. get to Gaia, you could still see that guy. So you can see that she picked, you know, which shows her, her, her ability and uh, observational skills. You know what wasn't needed? The line, not 15 seconds later, of Gaia gave me this intel. Leave it. Let me think. Let me let me be a critical viewer. I don't think that was for the audience so much as that was like talking, you know, like, you know, 
let me lay it down for you for a fury moment. I I, th I think that was more Talos talking feel, shop. With Nick to me, it felt like he looked down the barrel of the camera and was like, I got this from Gaia. And I feel like those kind of moments and the, the world leaders one feels like one of those moments of like, here's all these world leaders. So we're obviously introducing that some of them are going to be scrolls. They're all scrolls. 15 seconds later, they're all scrolls. Well, I think it's the fact that they're montaged to us. I yeah. think if, I think if you had even shown us these people in the first episode, I think if you had even found a way to be like, okay, here's shooter fucking McGavin is, Tucker Carlson and here's this world leader speaking and here's that world leader speaking. And then there's that one guy who doesn't wear a suit who is there for some reason um, that you have all of them like showing up from day one. And then you show them again, reacting to the attack in Russia. And then you show them as scrolls, you know, yeah. that like, like I, I think if you stagger that out a little bit more, the reveal may have been more effective than just here's a montage of a bunch of talking heads. Oh, surprise, all of these mover and shakers are scrolls. It feels like they're afraid to tell a real spy. Like they're afraid to put mystery on the table. I I don't agree with you on that. I don't I I I see it very much differently. I think that there has been a lot of questioning of people's motives throughout. I think you have a spy story in Gaia being a mole. And her flipping on uh, Gravik that that had that reached a very interesting uh, fever pitch in this episode. Um, I think you have a fascinating spy story about a political thriller uh, in the you know recognition that Gravik has a timetable as to when he wants the world to start nuking itself, and watching Fury and Talos hall ass to prevent it and i think you have a very fascinating uh story going on with gravix um you know push to cause push for a nuclear holocaust so that earth can become new scrollos i i do see like four three or four different spy stories all happening at once we just know answers to other people's stories from the from whatever perspective we're in because we're getting everybody in their own spy thriller. I guess. Cause so for example, I like the, the interaction between, um, I almost said Gaelic. That's not right. Gravic. Gravic. Thank you. I'm like, there's an R in there somewhere that I am just not placing. Um, Gravik and Gaia at the end where he like, it, it feels like his plan the whole time was to out Gaia. Like he needed to be sure. And he knows that this plan. I like it's a win-win for him because either this plan will work or he's going to get the mole. Or there's only one, the, like the mole will have to reveal themselves. Or I take like a shitload of UN people off the map in one felt swoop. Right. So I like that portion of it. It's and very I, much I, a Palpatine gambit. And I like that. Yeah, I think, except it actually makes sense, unlike a Palpatine gambit. Okay, um, well, okay, 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 <laughs> settle down. I hired a guy who hired a girl who hired a bug. <laughs> okay, okay. Who hired a robot okay, who hired a Marcus, bug. Okay, Marcus. Listen. I love that clip too. I love that clip too, but I'm going um, to get in my prequel soapbox. This is not the Star Wars show. Um, I, I enjoy those things and I think part of it too, and I'm not above admitting it or below admitting it is that part of it is like, I want to be confused. I want, I want the secret invasion where I don't know who's a scroll and who isn't. And I think I need to accept we're not getting that story. We're getting the story of. Nick Fury interacting with these scrolls that has been boiling for 30 years behind the scenes that we haven't seen. And the, the spy thriller of it all is the, what you're saying and not these characters, like characters we've known about for a long time have not been who they've said they are for a while. And 
like uh, like I said, there's there's moments where I thought they were going. You to... want more paranoia? Yes. Yeah, I want I want to feel like I'm questioning everything around me, and when I start to do that, like anything I start to question, the show goes, "Oh no, this is the answer." You were right. Like the the thing we showed you was the answer, and that has semi like not disinterested me obviously because I'm still watching it, but like. Because what what's there is good. Yeah. If I if I detach that feeling, I was on the edge of my seat the whole episode. Right? Like the the thriller aspect is great. The mystery aspect that maybe I'm pretending I was promised. I'm again in, in going with the discourse of like we were promised. I think the it's the name. I, and I yeah. think it's I think it's a name issue. I think that and again, we talked about this before with that whole thing with like the, the the writers and the director, like don't read the fucking comics where it's like, OK, but like you're you're leading with this name that implies a trust no one story. Where so far, the only person who's been explicitly duplicitous has been a good guy. Fucking with the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And that. You know, like the only real double cross that has happened against our heroes, pardon my hiccups, is Talos shepherding in like the million plus scrolls under Fury's nose. But like, because like again, I don't I don't know how long they want to hold on to any answers about what Fury has been doing for the past 30 odd years. But like, I think that's also going to be a big sticking point is like, did Fury just like decide he didn't have time to get to I'm find sure the new Skrullos? Did he try and fail and just didn't have the heart to tell them? Did he offload this uh, objective to Danvers and she got caught up with other shit? Like, the the reason why Fury shat the bed on this objective, I think, is going to be really important, and because and because everybody but Nick Fury is talking about it, it gets weird. Um, and I don't know. I I, I think that's going to be another big sticking point moving forward to just kind of like tell us like what, what's going on here. I, I I'm getting mildly nervous. We're going to have a Hawkeye situation. Because my biggest issue with Hawkeye was I loved that show. It was so much fucking fun. The need for Dare for I'm sorry for Kingpin to be a twist murdered the momentum of that show for me. And it made the 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 final episode feel like a, a game of catch up mm -hmm. to make Kingpin's presence be felt. Despite the right. fact, the, despite the like the weird pronoun game that happened with him throughout the whole fucking show, right? And whereas I think there's a version of Hawkeye that is much better if you just see Wilson Fisk at that fucking auction in the first episode, and you go throughout the rest of the story being like, "Yeah, this is Wilson Fisk. This is the kingpin. This is the guy who like has nearly killed the Devil of Hell's Kitchen multiple times." You know, like you just lean into that as as opposed to like, oh, it's like a it's a one episode thing. And now nobody's happy because the people who were boohooing Fisk being in it because like cameos cause brain cancer or whatever, um, even though it's not a cameo, I'm using that colloquially. Um, but like you have the cancer, the, 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 the cameos cause brain cancer community going oh look like that like this this episode fell flat because it was all about kingpin instead of like being a finale and then you have the people who wanted she hulk to be a secret daredevil show being angry that like oh they wasted the kingpin uh because he's only in one fucking episode and because it's the end of the show the good guys need to win now and he gets bodied by kate bishop um so now we're angry that like a young woman beat up the kingpin and now that's a whole fucking thing too as opposed to it just being a whole show where he's the bad guy, you know, um, and you remove yeah. them, you know, it, it, it and I think it's a, the, the Hawkeye situation is extra, for lack of a better word, egregious because Vincent D'Onofrio tweeted about being in the show the day the trailer came out. 
And then like the rest of the show just pretends it isn't the kingpin until the end. But anyway, yeah, I'm getting worried no, but- that like we're hanging on this moment where we finally find out why Fury was not able to find a new Skrullos. And I'm just worried that by the time that happens, it's like, well, graphics already setting off fucking nukes, dude. I don't know how to feel about your fuck up because we're on the, we're on we're on the we're on the doorstep of a nuclear holocaust. I don't fucking okay. Sorry, Fury was a dick. You're nuking people. You know, it's it's. I I also have a lot of hang ups about how that's going to end, but I do want to come back to the episode itself. Because I do love the intrigue here. I do love the fact that that we get moments like what you were talking about. Like when Fury just kind of stares at his wife's phone. We don't know what he knows. You know, mm-hmm. like, like I think that's very important to the to the show and to what you were saying is that like we don't see Fury, you know, do some weird hacker shit with his glasses to see what's on her phone while she's on, while she's talking. Yeah. We don't watch him pick it up and look and flip it open and look at it. We don't see, we don't see shit. We do not see Nick Fury do a motherfucking thing, but we know that he like stared at that phone. And then the next time we see him be like, there's so, there is a high ranking individual in the United States government who is a scroll. Who's one of, who's one of graphics men. You know, we don't know. We don't know how he knows that. And despite the very big teeing up of War Machine being a scroll, we don't know that for certain. For all we know, Fury's wife, whose name escapes me at the moment, is like running interference. And that Rhodey is also running interference on the situation. Like this could be a like cross double cross triple twist type situation where like we're like oh my god Rhodey's a scroll Rhodey's a scroll Rhodey's a scroll let him turn green and then oh no fuck you we've all like like it it, there's a thousand twists that could happen there and the fact that it is left that ambiguous for the entirety of the episode is one of my favorite things the show's done so far um especially with how vague that conversation is at the end I need to speak with graphic. Well, you got me. What the fuck does that mean? Is she, is she fucking working with graphic? Did Rhodey intercept her? And is like, you got one chance to squeal. Otherwise it's going to be weapons free. There's so much that could be going on there. And I love the fact that like we, as the audience have like for years now, just decided that Rhodey's probably a scroll. Cause it's only a matter of time until they do that story that even before they announce secret invasion, we were talking about how Rhodey has to be a scroll. That like we primed ourselves for it. This could be an amazing moment to subvert expectations, and I'm really fascinated by it. Yeah, the Fury's wife, and this is what I'm talking about. I would want that to be explored, like the whole next episode. And Grant, we might not have the real estate for this to be like, is she or is she not? Yeah. You know, what's what's going on with that? And I feel like in the first 10 minutes of the next episode, we're going to get the answer and then in, like instead and get whatever the fallout of her decisions are and where she stands is. And I'm not saying that my. I'm, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. And likely what we're going to whatever we get is the best outcome. For this story. Because again, I'm not a writer. Um, I can't stress that enough. You can't read. Can't read. Can't write. Can barely make it to the bathroom in time. Uh, they might as well put me back in kindergarten. I convinced myself when I was like seven that I couldn't read. Fun fact. Every... This is the third episode in a row where we've added to the Travis can't read lore. I'm I'm not kidding. Like my mom had to trick me into remembering that I could read. I was like six. Yeah. <laughs> it was like kindergarten or first grade. I don't remember which. And I was like, 
yeah, we're reading books, but like I can't read yet. So like I had I had convinced myself that because I never explicitly been taught how to read that I obviously could not read, even though I was reading every like you know everyday things around me I could read. I was just like, well, that's not reading. It's that it's that weird sense of paranoia that you can't actually read. You've just memorized a lot of things. I mean, yeah, like I think in my brain, I was like, oh, reading isn't like reading a book. Well, I don't do that, so I can't read. And my mom sat me down. I think I own like the very first chapter of Dragon Ball Z as like a, a trade issue of manga, which is weird because that's not how that works, but like I own it. Um, and she sat me down with that and was like, what does the speech bubble say? And I read it, like I just read it out loud, and she was like, You can read, idiot. <laughs> like, come on. You can read, you fucking dumb dumb. Yeah. That um, is so funny. Yeah. I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, you know, I make this joke all the time. That did happen. I was a lot older than I maybe I was younger than I thought I was, and this wasn't as big of a deal. But I was I definitely feel like I was in like first grade when this happened, which is way too old to be pretending like you can't read. You gaslit yourself into thinking you can't yeah. read. Um. Anyway, point being, I my instinct is to have the like is, the Fury's wife storyline hang for an episode, and I think we're gonna get the answer in the first five to ten minutes of the next one. It's probably for the best that that happens, so we can actually get plot. Yeah, you know. Um. And like for me, a big example of that is in this episode. The episode's called Betrayal. And I don't know why in my head I was like, oh, Talos is going to turn. <laughs> How bananas would that have been? I thought they switched in the museum. My it's brain. It's funny went, you say that. It's funny you say that because tangentially related to that. Have you seen the two Furies theory? I've also been thinking about that. And I have not seen what you're talking about, but I've been like, obviously Fury can't be a scroll the whole time. But what are like what are the chances? But the well, what I really enjoy though is the idea that like, though like the two Furies aren't communicating, and that what we're seeing is like two desperate like disparate situations that we as the audience are thinking are connected. When in reality, there's just there, like, there is a chance that like one of the Furies, maybe the one who wears glasses, is like actually a scroll, and every time we see him doing something, like that has nothing to do with like Fury on a mission with Talos. That like I love that he that, like Fury just kind of and it's not my theory. I've seen it floating around, you know, new rock stars was talking about it. Um, shouts out the yeah. homie Ken Knapsack who writes for uh, new rock stars now. Um, hell yeah. Yeah. No, if yeah. we get some kind of reveal like that at the end of the show and like, that's been the deception the whole time. Great. I'm satisfied. Show is perfect. Um, it'll get my standard Marvel TV show a that I give every Marvel TV show. Um, and I'll move on. If I don't get that, A minus. <laughs> you know? Uh, this is why people don't take the cape shit people seriously, Travis. <laughs> why? Because I like my cape shit. I know, I know. You like things. I like things. Iron Man 2 is an A. Fight me. <laughs> Listen, you're, 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 you're on air with the Wild Wild West guy, so... Not like I'm gonna. You're you're on air with the Wild Wild West Phantom Menace guy. You're that's, not. That's fair. Any, you're not gonna get any pushback from me. I'm I'm on record still. No, I don't hate them like I used to. But I have a really tough time with Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. I have a harder time with clones than I do Menace. I do too. I feel like I can meme more. Menace, than, like I say that like Phantom Menace isn't in my top three at this point. But like, but you, I think it to some degree, not to the same degree. You feel about Phantom Menace like I feel about Iron Man too. If that makes sense, not that you've been Stockholm, but like, 
you appreciate everything <laughs> about it, even its flaws, and love it more for it. Like, like your your extreme feelings about it came together and formed just love, and now you're here. Yeah, right? like that's a good way yeah. to describe it. That's how I feel about Iron Man too. I don't feel that way about Menace and Attack of the Clones. Maybe it's because they use like basically the same music in the scene, but like when I think of like Star Wars action, not not necessarily like a lightsaber duel, but Star Wars action, I have the image in my head of like Obi Wan and Qui Gon cutting down battle droids and the droid control ship at the beginning, mm-hmm. like that. But do 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 do. Yeah. Well, like Roger, you can never Roger. you can you can't it's, separate it's, the fact that like that was. You were you've been in Star Wars since the womb, right? Basically, and like growing up with those movies means you're gonna love them regardless. And I didn't, right? I came into Star Wars later, and so I came in in the middle of the prequels are bad discourse, and I still love Revenge of the Sith. Um, but I love Revenge of the Sith the same way more positive but like in the same way that i love iron man 2 and you love phantom menace and you know etc etc um and i i think and my big thing is like how we treat them when we are together as a group watching them because like we 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 pay attention to phantom menace yeah as a group we don't pay attention to attack of the clones except for like i hate sand I I don't know. I I I wish my like more developed Star Wars opinions were in play when we were doing those marathons as youngins. Dude, I the the classic like if you But then, could go then back. I get afraid, but then I get afraid that like if I like had my like full like development where I was like no, like we talk about art the wrong way that if I had gotten to that point as a person while we were like locked in my Nana's basement for 13 hours watching like eight ish movies that maybe I would have been the vegan standing next to the beef nachos. Yeah. That like yeah, that there may I, have come a point where like, I also was like, but guys like, like, I know it's easy to make fun of, but you're not engaging with it. And like, you know, I can't I can't demand everybody engage with something on a certain level that like I am able to not able to. But like I like like the art does not put me off to the point where I can't engage in that way. And I mean, and but that that way of thinking, it's so funny for me, that way of thinking of like you're not engaging with what it's trying to tell you is why I fucking love Batman v Superman so much. For the longest time, I was like, I was like, I'm going to jump in front of bullets because Martha's brilliant. Um, eventually turned into me going, wait a minute, The Phantom Menace is the most important Star Wars movie. <sighs> the I deep still... Sigh. Not you, but like I get baffled when I hear people talk about. And again, I understand that it's the in the same way that like as young white boys growing up in the basically the Midwest suburbs, right? Yeah, we have we had to fight down a lot of prejudices that were insto- bestowed upon us. I feel like me more so than you based on like our families and stuff. And not that my families are, my family's particularly like bad, but like the society around us bestowed upon us, like certain things that we've had to fight down and like purge from our brains. I'm, I'm doing that on a less extreme level w- with talking about art. Like we said, you know, there's no such thing as objectivity. There's no such thing as like, a good or a bad movie. There's just a movie you like and a movie you don't like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that being said, I cannot fathom a world where I like Batman v Superman. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I think we're going to move into the Q and a segment. <laughs> um, Let's do Secret it. invasion. Good. Rhodey's a scroll. Um, 
the gun. And Make the me question here. everything more, please. Oh, oh, real quick, real quick. Brody called him Nick in episode two, by the way. Ooh, you right. Before Didn't we think do about move that. on. Before we do move on. And when he said it, I legit went, hey, now. That was a thing, Captain Marvel, wasn't it? Um, I, th- I think when it happened on my end, it. I don't. Rec- I didn't recognize it as that. I recognized it as a like, Rhodey's trying to purposefully disrespect him by calling him a different. Oh, name. like he like like he's big dicking Fury. Yeah, like I'm gonna put it on the table right now. It's not Colonel. It's not Director. I'm not gonna address you by your last name. Right. Fascinating. But I think you're right. I think you're totally right. Anyway, so, uh, circling back here. Oh boy. I'm gonna start with this one from Director Jake. Uh, oh, first of all, um, Travis, so much has happened. I don't think I even got a chance to tell you about this. Uh, first of all, uh, to Director Jake and Ray Clausen, both of whom uh, said similar things at the beginning of their questions. Uh, thank you guys uh, for the well wishes. Uh, Taylor and I were in a little bit of a car accident uh, this past week. I uh, meant to text you about this and I forgot. It's okay. I hope you're okay and I love you very much. I, I very much understand what... Uh, an experience like that can be, as you know. Yeah, mine was. <laughs> I did not end up in the fucking telephone pole like you did. Okay, we. What basically happened was some fucking putts. So, you're coming down. It's R- Road I Road for any, because I know there's a decent amount of like Western PA people who w- watch and listen. We're coming down Road I Road, we're two minutes away from our fucking house. There's this big, this is Napa Auto Parts up here, right? Mm-hmm. And they have like a little driveway that goes onto the road. And there's like a bunch of other places that basically just jut right into right onto road eye. And this asshole, this chuckle fuck zooms out mm-hmm. of the fucking Napa auto parts on the little hill hill here and gets right in front of this guy uh, in a fucking Subaru. So Subaru guy fucking has to slam on the brakes. And then Subaru guy slams on the brakes. So we got to slam on the brakes. And we did not slam them brakes hard enough. Uh, and then boom, right into the fucking uh, guy on the Subaru. And just kind of like folded the whole front shit mm-hmm. in. Um, we're okay. Um, you know, Taylor has some bumps and bruises and is uh, pretty sore. Uh, I'm still a little achy, thankfully. You know, the worst thing that happened to me was I breathed in all of the airbag powder. Um, and I was already getting over, I'm still trying to get over this like, weird sinus shit I have going on. And uh, I was like having trouble breathing throughout the night. So, and Taylor has really bad asthma. She was like, you know, she recommended I take a breathing treatment, which I had not done since I was a kid. And I forgot. Uh, that albuterol uh, is like cocaine. And uh, I was just jittery for like two hours that night. Like I did the breathing treatment and I'm just like this. Uh, Like I'm fucking vibrating. Um, But yeah, no, there's a decent amount of, uh, you know, everybody on Twitter. Thank you. Uh, And everybody, because I mentioned it in the Q&A post this week where I was like, hey, sorry, this is like incredibly late. I said this would be out on Sunday and uh, here's why it isn't. Uh, So anyway, thank you guys very much. So Jake's question. Uh, So I hope you're doing all right after the wreck. My question is, why do you think there's been so much negativity about talking about Marvel and Star Wars projects in the last couple years? And I was I just had discourse on the mind when we got that conversation going earlier. Uh, and then I realized like, oh shit, like we're kind of starting to like do the conversation before the question, um, to answer that, uh, I do want to say, I think one of the biggest problems with the discourse right now is there is a desire to be smarter than what you're watching. I think there is this very cynical you know, way of looking at corporate art that makes people want to kind of inherently view it as silly or beneath them. Um, 
where you have situations uh, where, well, well, let me pause that. You have people who want to be smarter than the show. And then you have the movie critic culture online uh, that has been there since the very beginning uh, mixed with people who like no words and lingo, but don't know what the fuck they mean, i.e. cameo meaning whatever the fuck you want it to, I guess. Um, I think you put those things together and add in this pinch of toxic nostalgia where new things are inherently bad, um, but because old things have become so exalted, those also the nostalgia also has to be inherently bad. You end up with this weird cycle um, when it comes to Star Wars. Uh, the way I've been talking, I, I've brought this up before in KNR. There's this really weird binary in the Star Wars fandom where a Star Wars project is either season two of The Mandalorian or it's The Last Jedi or Andor. And that is the only way Star Wars fans know how to react to anything anymore. It is either this is so much bigger than just nostalgia. It understands Star Wars. It's it's it has it has big concepts. It's for adults. It subverts your expectations. You know, it's not pew pew kitty laser bullshit. Or it's oh my god, I fucking love this because I know that guy. 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 This is fun. This isn't like super heavy, but it's also like got an emotional weight to it. And that's a, and that's a gross oversimplification of those things, and that's the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, I think you throw that slurry together, and you end up in situations where people like talk about nostalgia as a pejorative. You know that again, like that that tweet I had that popped off this past week, where it was like all of these people who were like, yeah, well, the fucking Mandalorian's the worst offender here because all of these characters keep showing up in it. And it, there comes a point where I go, what the fuck does that have to do with anything? What the fuck does that have to do with the quality of this show? Now, again, if for you, it takes you out of the experience. Again, this is all subjective. All subjective. Like Travis said, objectivity, throw it out the window here. Not of that doesn't fucking matter. But I think there is a little bit of like internet brainworm. I hate to use the term groupthink, but there is this level of like, oh, well, Star Wars theory burst into tears because Luke Skywalker was carving up the Dark Troopers. And if he was emotionally moved by it because a lightsaber went burr, this is inherently stupid. And it's like, no, he didn't get it. I cry when I see Luke Skywalker in The Mandalorian, and it's because he represents everything the Jedi are supposed to in that moment. He is a hero who is protecting a child who is on the way to save the day because a baby asked him to protect him. And that is why I cry. It has nothing to do with this weird, you know, idea of Luke. And I think that with relation to Star Wars theory, people like him, people in that fandom menace space have like poisoned the discourse to the point where the, the 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 incoherent complaints that they have about this material have bled into people who just don't like it and i don't think don't know why they don't like it and it's okay to be like eh, it just didn't work for me and that's a perfectly fine answer but i think there are a lot of people who go this didn't work for me and you know what i think this guy is right too many women. I do think there are certain people who get like who 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 get literally infected by that mindset. And I also think there's something to be said for the fact that like Star Wars and Marvel are back on top. You know? Like fucking Grogu capitalism is out of control and the MCU has had an a a nearly in undisputed box office domination hitherto unknown. And I think it's fun to root against the big dog. I think there's a lot of uncharitable criticism about Disney era Star Wars and the MCU that are centered on it's Disney and it's big and it's incredibly popular. 
that doesn't give Disney a free pass to be a shitty corporation. It doesn't undo any valid criticisms that people have about anything. But at the end of the day, I think there is this like weird mindset to like attack something like she Hulk, you know, um, I can't remember his name and it doesn't matter, but there's this one guy on fucking TikTok who like embodies everything. I don't want to be when it comes to talking about Cape shit where Every conversation is like, this thing was fucking trash. And here's this laundry list of like vague reasons why I didn't like it. Um, that don't that don't really land on anything other than just I didn't like it. And that's fine. But like I saw this video he posted either today or the other day where he's, he's, he's like the three biggest problems the MCU has right now is a lack of accuracy to the comics quality and some other random fucking thing but i'm like what the fuck do you mean the, the biggest problem in the mcu is quality right now that, you're just saying fucking words that's meaningless i don't that doesn't mean anything i think I, I, I have a lot of very no you're good i'm about to rant for even more i have a lot of abstract <laughs> concepts i want to bring up that i'm going to kind of tie all together okay because you know probably adhd brain does this um in fact that's part of the problem so i saw this post this has nothing to do with what we're talking about yet i saw this post a few months ago that someone was like hey people that don't respond to messages right away like you you sit on a text for two or three days what's your life like <laughs> Like not even in a mean way. They were just like, what what causes you to not respond to message right away? And the person that responded was like, the idea of being able to instantaneously check up on somebody, to instantaneously be able to communicate with somebody that is not within 10 feet of you is so new to us as a species. That our, our level of communication has evolved so fast beyond anything we could comprehend that we can't keep up. Does that like you know what I mean? Yeah. So this idea of forming opinions on art and forming opinions on media has accelerated beyond anything we can imagine. You can't take the time to form a full opinion because then you're out of the talking loop. And you don't get to have one anymore. Like you feel like you have an invalid take if you're not talking about it while everyone else is talking about it. On a separate axis. I mentioned Gamergate before. But like one of the things that Alex talked about in that podcast that I don't think I knew about were the test runs of gaming Twitter before Gamergate happened. Specifically, uh, hashtag cancel Father's Day. Damn, that's fucking archaic at this point. Exactly. Is, yeah. Wow. And so this this idea of gaming the system of discourse and like just in general discourse of like if you can get a couple people to pick something up as if it were a real talking point, it's going to explode. And the issue is because it's not a real talking point everything you say on either direction, everything you say about it's going to be abstract and meaningless. And anything you apply it to is going to have that same effect. And like, you know, the all right pipeline aside, you know, this discounting the Nazi of it all. When you have people that make a living off getting clicks from having an opinion, the fat and like you have to be fast because otherwise you don't have an opinion and so you can't properly process everything and you need it to be in a way where everyone can agree with you that someone can pick that up and roll with it we've completely gamified how we talk about this stuff and like i i love our conversations about things because i feel like you and i find points as we talk and like bounce off each other really well and have a real discussion. Yeah. As opposed to like, and we, like we talk about things, the same things over and over again. You know how many times I've said, I don't like BVS on this podcast. Oh yeah. 
that times a hundred in, in like my normal life and the conversations I've had with people, that opinion has formed over so long that I feel like it's a valid take for me to have. A wise man once said that the death of art and media and meaningful media analysis came the day that we decided to talk about movies and television like it was sports talk radio. Yes. And don't get me wrong. There are some good things that have come out of this era of, you know, film and media analysis uh, meaning meaningful and, permutations of different media and art but at the end of the day like everybody wants to just throw words like cameo plot hole mary sue around to the point where these conversations are fucking meaningless and exactly. are incoherent you know like i just I, I i i don't i don't know how to make sense out of a lot of this like really weird negativity that is and almost like, born out of this this is a very strange dichotomy of like entitlement mixed with uh, elitism. And you have these and two forces just ramming into each and other. And so we have our axis of communication evolving too fast. We have our axis of gamifying how we talk about this stuff. The third axis, if you will, is the privilege of it all. And like, I feel like you and I don't suffer this at all. If we ever did, um, a lot of young white men, especially the ones that don't believe in the privilege they have, don't understand that part of that privilege is being represented in, in the art you consume. And I think a very, another big negative effect on us kind of is that we've identified too much with the hero that has the struggle. Like, I think there's a lot of people in this world whose lives are better than they think they are. And this is again, talk in general. I feel like I have to clarify that but like their life is better than they think it is. And they think they're an outcast and they're struggling because their favorite characters in art are outcasts and struggling. When in reality, a lot of it is them reflexively doing it to themselves because they don't want to be open about their feelings or open about the things they are struggling with, yeah. open about their mental health, things of that nature. Um, I'm a victim of it. I'm sure you're a victim of it. Absolutely. Like that discussion doesn't happen. Instead, these people, because they get to be so represented, get so many examples thrown on them as a kid of guy who has to get hit while he's down over and over again to rise up and win. But now they're in that mindset of I'm getting hit over and over again while I'm down, but I'm going to rise up and I'm going to win as the landscape of media changes to finally be a little more inclusive of women and people of color and people who are gay and people who are trans. And like, obviously none of that is perfect. I'm not going to pretend like we're doing a good job of that right now. But as that shift begins to happen, these people start to disengage from that media and they, they don't have the time, or at least they're not taking the time, and that's not necessarily their fault, to engage with, well, why am I disengaging with this? Oh, I just, this isn't made for me. I don't identify with this and that's okay. And so yeah. it spins into well, what, or what these other I was gonna say, or you you have the more unfortunate version of that where it oh turns yeah, I'm into I'm like, going into a fucking very positive. replacement mentality. Yeah, where it's like I, Luke, or it's like Ray instead of Luke, and not Ray and Luke. Yeah, I am I'm doing the very best possible outcome of this <laughs> happening, where like the person doesn't take the time to realize like oh. This isn't made for me and I don't enjoy it as much because of that. And that's okay to like, I'm going to reach for all of these non words and non complaints, which adds negativity to the discourse because I don't know how to understand what I'm feeling, which takes time and takes effort and takes like a knowledge that you don't know what you're feeling to begin with that. Like we need to be, do a better job of helping people come to understand in a non combative way 
And then on top of that, you have the people that then fall into the replacement theory idea and end up going down all three axes at once. Yeah. Uh, check out I didn't the mean, medicine, how we got here. <laughs> I didn't mean for this to be a Nazi metaphor at the very end, but here we are. I, you know, when you said the third axis, I was like, okay, this is where yeah, we're no, going. I, All right. I said it on purpose because I thought about it in the moment. I didn't intend for that to happen when I started. Sensational. Um, Director Jake, I feel like I've said this every time you ask a, co- you, you ask a very big picture question. You Both ask you a like two hour awesome. long podcast talking point questions and yeah director jake will literally just be like hey here's an episode to just tag on to your fucking uh news roundup and we're not complaining um our other question for the week from ray clausen hey glad you're all right i'm so sorry that happened i hope you and taylor are doing all right and feeling better thank you again uh, my question is, what do you feel is going to happen with the DC origins of the hero in James Gunn's new universe? I believe it's rumored that there will not be an origin story for Superman and Superman Legacy. Just want to know your guys' thoughts. I think it would be cool to have the origin be in animated shorts, uh, similar to Tales of the Jedi. Since Gunn mentioned actors working in both live action and animation, I'll keep you guys in my thoughts and wish you the very best. Thank you, Ray. Um... I quite like the idea of being able to just kind of jump into Superman being Superman. I think I think it's a fucking fantastic idea to do like animated and like not anthology, but like animated, like, you know. Quickies kind of like almost. a quickie. Kind of like a montage quickie. You know, like 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 a little quick animated, like, you know, okay, here's Krypton, kaboom, uh fucking pod, earth. Martha Joseph Kent, why did you say that name? Boo, hey, you can't play football because you'll liquefy liqu- that fucking kid. Oh, okay, cool, I guess. I'm a stand-up good dude and I'm a good person and I saved people this one time and all of Smallville knows my secret, but because Smallville fucking rules, nobody tells on me. And now I'm going to go be a big reporter. Like having that, like like doing like a little animated short, I think it'd be great. I think it'd be great. I think I'd, I'd be very fascinated with the Batman one, you know, because like we don't know, we still don't know what direction they're going to go with Batman, you know. Um, I know I do uh, love the idea of just kind of skipping the origin here with Superman. I think that with these heroes who are just so well known, like we culturally are able to, like we culturally are able to hop over it. And I think there's this weird, like when we talk about um, the Batman, for the Batman is a great example. That everyone was talking about, you're not going to watch Thomas and Martha Wayne die again. That does not mean that these characters' origin stories aren't still incredibly important to who they are. That's the fucking point. Um, so Not like, including the origin lets you tell a full story. Yeah. Like, the, the, the issue a lot of early superhero movies have is that they... They knew tailoring to a, an audience that wasn't all comic book readers meant they had to show a full character like start to finish how does this guy end up dressing up like a bat and we're at the point now we are privileged enough now to not need that okay here's a question for you do you consider batman 89 an origin story movie because we see multiple flashbacks to the wayne murder and like it's made clear that this is like 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 these are the two like the the, like the these two parallel lines are finally going to intersect again between Jack Napier and Bruce Wayne right i think and i think that's the difference is that especially at, back then as well besides the the origin story aspect we were making very original stories Batman 89 is not really a straight adaptation of any comic book. Um, any of those Batman movies are not real adaptations of any. And that's okay. That's not a negative thing as you know, it's just, I, Oh yeah, this is inspired by Batman and his rogues gallery than right. the, the sporting characters in, uh, in Gotham city. Right. And so 
as we transitioned into a world where we became like the general public is more aware of comic book stories, right? Like it's a big deal to adapt flashpoint. It's a big deal to adapt death of Superman. It's a big deal to adapt the dark Knight returns. And I think that's a dangerous line to walk. And one of the easiest ways to not walk it is to not do it. And part of that is the origin where, like, you don't have to show it. We know. And, I, again, the Batman is the perfect example because we don't have to see the Waynes get murdered to understand the impact it's having on the sto- on the plot as it is. like Yeah, not movie, just Bruce, but the plot of the movie. Like, yeah. Like the way the the way the Waynes influence the plot of the Batman would be needed is needed to be told to us whether or not we see the murder. So we don't need to see the murder. Yeah. We do we do not need to see any pearls hit the sidewalk and bounce around. If if the point of if Pa Kent's gonna have a, a big deal like we know Pa Kent dies and Pa Kent's gonna be a big part of the story of Superman Legacy, I don't need to see Pa Kent die. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we can we can skip that point. And if something relevant happened in that that string of events that needs to be known, you can show me that thing in particular. And I think that's something that Batman 89 does. Where like the way the way murder itself is important to the plot of Batman 89 because Jack is the one to do it. And so in that case, it's necessary. In the and again, different time. For once it was a different time is actually a legitimate argument. <laughs> um, no, I think like absolutely you get to play with the, uh, the origins a little bit more and you get to, I, I think the animated shorts is a good idea. My, my only concern is being very, very clear that they tie into the movies. Like the communication on that is so key. And I trust James Gunn with that because he's so open. About I mean, everything. he's even said like, they're, like the, the live action animation like is going to be a two way street that like, there's going to be people who yeah. are voicing these characters who appear as them in live action and vice versa. And yeah, I just, I, I always worry for like in, in a shared universe environment, the conversation of what is and isn't canon. Cause I remember when spider verse was announced, people were like, Oh, is spider verse going to be MCU? There was a lot of discussion around that. Yeah. A lot of confusion. Home. What'd you say? And then they made no way home and they said, yeah. And they were like, oh, well you see Reddit and, but we did it right this time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think the, uh, we don't need to see origins unless it becomes very prevalent to the plot. I think that the people they have writing these plots are good enough at doing it to do more of the Batman and I'll be happy. I will say I'm really interested in this new Superman show and in the movie to see how they adapt Superman to present day. Because as we are entering the death of journalism as, as it exists, how do you adapt to the most popular superhero of all time? Who was a journalist and his love interest slash wife who was a journalist working for a known publication. The failing New York Times, the failing Daily Planet. Um, I'm, I'm just really interested to see where they go with that aspect of it in terms of like standing points of the character. Yeah. You know? Cause that's, that's I, something Spider-Man. Uh, sorry. One more thing. Like the Marvel Spider-Man know. movies, the, the MCU ones, have nothing to do with Peter Wer- and the granted neither did Tasm, but Tasm. Um uh, no 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 he does in the second one. Oh he does? Yeah there's a there's a scene where he's like emailing J. Jonah Jameson like you know oh well Daily Bugle see yeah. I need to watch these movies. I, I need you to do. watch them so I can properly criticize them. You did you said that very confidently and incorrectly. That's what I'm about, baby. That's what I'm about, baby. That's the teen app way, motherfucker. Anyway. Um, yeah, you know. How do you work around those things? I think that's going to be a much more interesting point than showing us the origin again. Because we I, don't need to see it. I think you're right. 
I think you're very right. Um, cool. All right. Well, I think that's all we got for you guys this week. Um, new KNR coming out next week. Uh, keep your keep your uh, I would say ear ears open. Ring bells and shit. It's gonna be a fun conversation. Um, I still have to add. Give me a dollar, guy, back into the stream yard. I keep forgetting until right now. Um, but a uh, little bit of uh, programming notes here. Like I said at the beginning, Heroic History 101 will be out soon. Uh, Topping Flashpoint, uh, Porter Angle versus Cal Dooku, going to be out again here soon. Uh, Indiana Jones review either next weekend or very early the following week. And continued Secret Wars. I did the same thing fucking you did. Uh, continued Secret Invasion coverage. Um, I have a couple idea, cool ideas for some topic episodes to get us through July uh, and into August. So obviously we'll be covering Ahsoka when that starts coming up. So stay tuned for all of that. Thank you to our $10 patrons. Keandre Lloyd. It didn't go. Keandre Lloyd. Oh. <laughs> Colin Provolone. Sir. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Feel yourself, Colin. Feel yourself. This is me, stealing myself. While you finish the outro, I'm gonna go pee. Okay. Uh, and thank you to Paco and his Patreon co-signer. Alex Jones. All right, ladies and gentlemen. From the front lines of the information war, it's Alex Jones. And uh, since we've talked about a lot of negative, toxic stuff in this episode, here, here, here's this banger clip we don't use enough. He almost tasted that. Num, 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 eat it up. Hopefully, okay, three, two, one. You know I'm the hottest. You ain't never got to heat me up. I'm oh, you. She-Hulk was throwing ass and you people complain. You fucking suck. Anyway, uh, that's the show. See y'all next week. Class dismissed. Stop! Move away from the cook!